A long time ago, the ancient saviors of humanity founded a village as their haven, with their descendants said to assist humanity in times of extreme chaos. This village, Kunlun, is located just beside the infamous Last Dungeon, a place where monsters of unimaginable strength reside, and which serves as the hunting grounds for Kunlun residents. Despite being accustomed to defeating powerful enemies since childhood, Lloyd Belladonna regards himself as the weakest in his village in terms of magic, strength, and intelligence. Even so, to fulfill his desire of becoming a soldier, he goes to the kingdom of Azami to enroll in its military academy. However, as someone whose upbringing defies common sense, Lloyd's innate power might just prove to be the key to end the crises enveloping the kingdom. In a dense forest, a kid named Lloyd is hunting. He spots a bunny and tries to catch it, but it tricks him and jumps at Lloyd's face. The bunny made him fall on his face to the ground. Lloyd gets up and hears someone calling to him. He looks up and sees his big brother, Shoma, standing on a huge branch of the tree which the bunny had escaped through. Shoma had caught the bunny when it tried to escape from Lloyd. Lloyd jumps happily and hugs Shoma. Shoma exclaims in awe at how big Lloyd has gotten. As they walk back home, Lloyd asks Shoma if it's fun living in the outside world, and tells him he'd like to go into the outside world too. Shoma replies that he needs to work hard enough so he can take him out there. Shoma brings a souvenir from his traveling bag and gives it to Lloyd as a gift. Lloyd is excited and thanks him for the gift. In the next scene, Lloyd knocks on the door of a small house. He opens the door and finds a lady dressed in purple, reading a book. Lloyd asks if she's Marie, the witch of the east side. The witch answers explaining to him that since ancient times, witches have granted wishes but at a price. She tells Lloyd to leave at once unless he's prepared to make a similar sacrifice. The witch closes the book she was reading and asks him what he desires that he would sacrifice so much for. But Lloyd boys respectfully and tells her that he has come from the countryside to be a soldier. He introduces himself as Lloyd Belladonna and confesses he wants to stay with her for a short while, but the witch angrily tells him to find an inn and check out the bulletin in the town square. Marie put in that she's a witch and not a handyman or an innkeeper. Marie asks him what country town he came from. Lloyd answers that he comes from a place called Kunlun. The witch seems startled and asks him who their village chief is. Lloyd responds that her name is Alka. Lloyd brings out a crystal from his bag and drops it on the table. He tells the witch that he was asked to show it to her. Marie looks frightened, but a minute later, the crystal emits some kind of light and then a lady emerges from the light. The lady tells Marie that she's Alka, her master. Alka tells the witch to take good care of Lloyd, her precious little village child. Before Alka leaves them, he assures Lloyd that anytime he feels lonely, she'll come by and snuggle with him. After Alka leaves, Marie gets furious lamenting that she thought she was finally free of Alka. Now she has made another request. Lloyd apologizes to the witch for all the inconveniences that he might have caused her, but she admits that it wasn't his fault. She told Lloyd she was going to take care of him till the entrance exams. She instructed him to go ahead and use the back room. Lloyd thanks her and says he looks forward to their time together. Marie went back to her seat and thought aloud that Lloyd seemed like a decent guy for someone close to Alka. Just then, Alka appeared in the room and told Marie she could turn her into a frog for the rest of her life. Marie is shocked to see her again but she explains that she uses the crystal as a gate to teleport to wherever she wants to be. She warns Marie to make sure nothing improper happens between her and Lloyd. Alka noted that she used Loli's grandma quite a few times as a way of mocking her. She added that as punishment, she used an ancient rune magic to give her the curse of repeated small misfortunes. Lloyd wakes up early the next morning and prepares breakfast. He takes a tray to Marie and tells her that he borrowed her kitchen. Marie says she doesn't mind. She admits that the pancakes were delicious. As they ate breakfast, Marie asked curiously why he wanted to be a soldier. Lloyd answers that he's the weakest in his village and that he can't gather firewood or catch a fish. He added that one time, he sparred with his big bro and he couldn't get up for a whole day. He tells Marie that there's someone he has looked up to since he was little, a strong and noble hero who shows up in novels too. Lloyd admits that he wants to be like him and that he'll never give up. Marie asks Lloyd if he knows what the entrance exams for the military academy at the Kingdom of Azami are like. Lloyd replies that he heard there's a combat test, a written exam about magic, and an interview. He admits that was all he knew. Marie tells him the most important thing is the combat test. Lloyd explains to the witch that his stamina is his weakness, and that it took him six whole days to get to her. Marie encourages him saying Kunlun is far from Azami, adding that six days by train isn't so bad. But Lloyd opens up to her and he runs down to her. Marie was shocked to hear this. She tells him his stamina was strong, but he insists that his grandpa had always said that it takes only two days for him to run that distance. Marie inquired if Lloyd encountered any monsters along the way, but he replied that he was so lucky 
and didn't happen to encounter any monsters along the way as he ran. He adds that he did come across some wild animals, which were huge locusts and fire-breathing lizards, but Marie cut him short, saying that those were monsters and they are dangerous too. As they discussed, Marie spilled some tea on her cheeks, but Lloyd gave her a clean piece of material to clean her face. After Marie cleaned her face, she realized that her skin seemed smooth. The spots and freckles she was concerned about were all gone. Lloyd explains that if one should apply that simple ancient rune before cleaning with a rag, then even the worst stains will come right off. Marie tells him that it was not a home remedy, but a disenchant rune, which she spent three years to learn and that it can remove any curse. Lloyd went to the city and was in awe of how big and crowded it was. He overheard some guys talking about the National Foundation Festival and discovered that a lot of people like him were there to train in the military. He decided that he was going to be focused as this was his first errand. Somewhere in the city, a lady bumps into a man and realizes the lady is the Belt Princess. He tells her that the rumors must be true as he hears the Belt Princess is applying to the academy. But the princess ignores him and walks away. The guy shouts at her that she should realize that she has caused some damage to the reputations of the local nobles. As the Belt Princess walks down a lonely path, she encounters a monster. But Lloyd came to her rescue and killed the giant-sized insect. He helped the Belt Princess up to her feet. He dusts the mud off her dress and cleans her face too, but the princess starts to hide her identity. Lloyd then told her that he had to go as he had errands to run, but the belt princess calls out to him and tells him her name is Selene. He also introduces himself and bids her goodbye. The belt princess could not help but think about Lloyd. She looked at the mirror, and her face wouldn't come off no matter what because she was cursed. She remembers how she's been mocked because of her face. There's a flashback to when her father had invited a pastor to say a word of salvation to her. The pastor had encouraged her that one day, strength would lift off her curse. From that day on, she had used those words to push herself harder and harder. The belt princess cries endlessly as she thinks that all the hope she has is for nothing. She tears off the belt from her face and discovers that she has been healed and free of her curse. Then she recalls that it was Lloyd who healed her. She breaks down and cries tears of joy, exclaiming that Lloyd is the man of her destiny. Lloyd went back home after buying the things the witch had sent her. He lays everything down and shows her the souvenir he bought with the remaining change for her. He gave it to her and left to prepare dinner. In another scene, two royalties are seen from a building. A man named Merthafan and a lady addressed as Colonel Cho Lin. The lady observes that there are a lot more people that year and it looks like there's more variety in the crowd too. She acknowledges that he must have gone out of his way to find lots of different kids. Merthafin replies that it's all for the peace of the nation, and that relations with their neighboring nations are only getting worse. He adds that the princess is missing, and that the stability of their nation rests on their strength, the military. But she insists that it's a bit risky too. She sets an example by citing Riho Flavin, aka the one-armed mercenary known for assaults against clients she doesn't like as well as border violations, etc. But Merthafan assures her that she is a mercenary at heart, and with the right contract, she won't cause any problems. Colonel Choline asks what kind of contracts he was talking about, and replies saying that he had told her that all of her outstanding warrants would be cancelled if she joined. As they discussed, she spotted the eldest of the noble Lydacane. Their local family had earned so many contract honors. His real name is Alan Toyn Lydacane, and he's in an argument with the Belt Princess. He asks harshly why the Belt Princess couldn't take the belt off before now, if she could do that. He further argues that if she could make herself presentable, she should have done that from the start. A soldier walks up to the campground and announces that they will begin a combat test immediately. He asks all of them to use any weapon to attack the dummy. The test results were finally released and Lloyd failed the combat test. At the academy, the Belt Princess and Merthafan are surprised Lloyd did not pass the combat test. Colonel Choline reads out the student's guidance. She explains to them that their kingdom is on the brink of war with their neighbor, the Jiu Empire. As she continues to explain, Merthofan thinks about how the nation's military force can be without Lloyd Belladonna. Colonel Choline continues to explain to the newbies that one headache they've had for five years now is the disappearance of Princess Maria Azami, and that anyone who finds the princess will receive a cash reward, a promotion, or other benefits. Lloyd wanders back home, he thinks to himself loudly, as he did terribly in both the martial arts and written exams. He admits that the results were not surprising, but at the same time still disappointing. Lloyd walks into a house by the road and enters. He finds a young man who seems furious to see him. The man asks him what he's looking for, but he replies that he meant to cause no harm. The man could see his hidden powers, which made him instinctively attack first. He wonders if Lloyd was trying to extract information from him, because he was a former royal guard. But Lloyd tells him 
He's there for the part-time offer. The man explains that the place is a cafeteria and asks him what kind of skills he has. Lloyd replies that he can cook and clean. He adds that back home he was number one in those skills. The man asks Lloyd to demonstrate his skills. Lloyd offered to cook risotto and left immediately for the kitchen. As Lloyd cooks in the kitchen, he admits that he just failed the military academy's entrance exams. He tells him the people in his village had a massive send-off party when he left. He adds that he didn't want to go home empty-handed and that he could stay in the capital for a while and try taking the test in the next year. Meanwhile, the Belt Princess, Mirtha Fan, Colonel Choline, and Riho Flavin are discussing and wondering how Lloyd failed his tests. Riho glances through his test papers and observes that Lloyd is a unique individual who can't contain his artistic impulses. Colonel Choline also goes through his test papers and discovers that his answers are ancient runes. Riho asks what the runes do, and the colonel replies that ancient runes combined with the caster's skills and magic power can accomplish incredible things that normal magic can't. Mirthafan tells them that he met the man who interviewed Lloyd. He explains that besides what he wrote on that exam sheet, the only magic he could use is to call rain. They all thought this was a lie, but Colonel Choline counters that he may not be lying and that if he can use ancient rune magic, calling rain wouldn't be out of the question. She concludes that this Lloyd kid could hold some truly amazing magical powers. Back in the cafeteria, Lloyd presented the tomato and white fish risotto he had just prepared to the owner of the cafeteria, who was formerly addressed as Chrome Molybdenum, former head of the Royal Guard. He was surprised that he finished cooking like a normal person. He still doesn't trust Lloyd and wonders if he's planning to strike while he is eating. He eats the food and admits it is delicious. He finally accepted to hire Lloyd. The belt princess alongside the trio walks back from the academy. She informs the rest of them that she'll find the missing princess and have Sir Lloyd invited to the academy as a reward. Colonel Choline agrees that it was a good plan. Back in the witch's house, Lloyd breaks the news to Marie and his chief. They both are surprised that he failed the test, but Lloyd assures them that he plans on taking the test the next year. Lloyd pleads with the witch to let him stay in her home for a while longer. He suggests that he will pay the rent as he has found a part-time job. Marie and the chief accept his proposal and permit him to stay in the city. Lloyd is excited that they all agree. He thanked them and went ahead to make dinner. Marie and Chief Alpha continue to discuss. Marie asks the chief that if she has so much strength to spare, she could go ahead and save their kingdom. Chief Alta asks how bad the situation is, and Marie goes ahead to explain that it has been five years since King Azami turned into a huge advocate for war. The culprit who is controlling the king should be declaring war at the upcoming National Foundation Festival. Many foreign officials and heads of state are invited to the festival that year and war will begin with the Jew Empire. Marie tells the chief that she doesn't want that to happen. But the chief replies that she has already explained that the villagers of Kunlun only assist when the threat is beyond human comprehension, like a demon lord or an epic disaster. The chief adds that they won't take part in silly squabbles between humans over pride and the resulting wars and incidents. Marie agrees that she knows about these and that it's the reason why she risked her life to learn the disenchanted rune five years ago. The chief warns Marie not to involve Lloyd in any part of it or else she will return Lloyd to Kunlun immediately. The belt princess, Selen, has gotten in a fight with Alan Toyne, but Lloyd was told to take Selen's place and fight Alan. He was told to give Alan a blow in the face, but just as he was about to punch him in the face, there was a whirlwind and Lloyd was nowhere to be seen. Miss Marie, the witch, was responsible for the whirlwind to save Lloyd from the trouble he found himself in. Marie advised Lloyd to avoid getting into trouble. As they talked, Chrome Molybdenum met with them and asked Lloyd to get back to the cafeteria. Chrome tells the witch that he knows the whirlwind earlier was her. Chrome admits he's very thrilled to see that she's well, and from the day she went missing, he hasn't been alive at all. Marie also tells him she's glad that he's okay but asks him what he was doing out there. Chrome narrated to Marie that he left the army, taking responsibility for having lost their princess and that he kept a low profile working as a cafeteria owner. But in secret, he had looked for her and tried to learn what made the king change. Marie acknowledges that she knows they've both been through a lot, but all that is about to change. She explains that the international summit taking place on the third day of the festival is when it will all go down. Marie further explains that the culprit is sure to manipulate the king and declare war on Ju. She tells him they have to stop that before it happens. Chrome asks the princess if she knows who the culprit is, but she replies that she doesn't, and that's why she needs his help. In another scene, Mirtha Fan is reviewing the training regiment again in an office. Colonel Choline admits he's quite a hard worker. 
Merthofan replies that it's for the peace of their kingdom, but Cholin insists and asks why he's so serious about it. Merthfan explains that, a long time ago, there was a famine, and his hometown was suffering from hunger and poverty. The Jiu army came and hit them when they were down. They took all the little supplies they had left. Merthofan vows he won't let such happen again. Meanwhile, Selina, the Belt Princess, and Riho are discussing their plan to find the princess and also get Lloyd into the academy. They decided to visit Marie, the witch known for peddling information. They knocked on the door, but it was Lloyd who came through to open it. Selene is surprised that Lloyd lives with the witch. Lloyd offers them coffee. A few minutes later, Marie walks in, complaining of how tired she is. She requests a beer with some magical ice. Marie notices the guests she has in her house and asks Lloyd who they are. Lloyd introduces the two ladies to Marie. Marie asks them what type of information they need. Selene replies that they're on a mission from their officers to find the princess. At this point, Marie felt uneasy and Riho observed and knew that something fishy was going on. Riho wonders what she's hiding and even notices that she resembles the princess. Selena tells Marie that they would love to know more about her. She asks her how long she's been living in the city. Marie replies that she's been living there for two years. Selene admits that she's devastated by this but that she wants to hear her say the truth. Marie asks them why they are so keen on finding the princess. But Selene responds that if they find the princess, they can get Sir Lloyd into the academy as a reward. Marie suggests that they trade information. She wants to know the state of the king, the academy, and the military presence in the castle. She tells them that any detail they could spare, no matter how small, will help her greatly. She pleaded with them saying that the country is in grave danger, but they insist that she come clear with who she is. She finally reveals herself to them as Princess Maria Azami. They were both surprised to learn that she was the missing princess. The princess then asks if they know a town named Kunlun, but they reply that they only heard of the town in a fairy tale. Maria tells them that Lloyd is from there. They were thrilled at that, and concluded that they could see where his strength came from. Marie further explains to them that Kun Loon forbids its villagers from getting involved in human conflicts. That's why Lloyd can't get mixed up with it. If he did, he'd be forced to go home, and his dreams would be dashed. Marie tells them that at the moment, in the central area, Everyone from cadets to street thugs is out fervently searching for the princess. The conditions set by whoever issued the search were to bring her immediately, dead or alive. Selena is disturbed by this and wonders who would issue such a mission. Marie guesses it is probably whoever's trying to start the war and that they're trying to stop those who oppose the war from using the princess as a symbol of peace. Marie adds that this makes it difficult to get things done. Riho and Selene agree to help the princess. Marie is all by herself. She is thinking about her next move and decides that all she has to do is release father using the disenchant room. In another scene, Riho and Selene are investigating the issue at hand. They came across a guy whom they questioned concerning the mission of capturing the princess. The guy confesses that he never saw the guy who asked him to search for the princess but that he repeated one phrase, like he was delirious. Riho asks him what phrase, and he replies, for the peace of the kingdom. Chrome, the owner of the cafeteria, is seen in the palace. He tells them that he's there to ask to be reinstated to military service. Merthofan assures him that the king has no doubt received his plea. He tells Chrome to go back home and wait for them to contact him. But Chrome interrupted him saying what the princess and her trusted friends had gathered. He's the only one who uses the phrase, for the peace of the kingdom. Chrome accuses him of being the culprit all this while. Merthofan laughs and confesses to being the culprit. Meanwhile, the princess and her trusted friends were listening to their conversation as if it was a setup. Merthofan is surprised to see the princess after she has revealed herself, but the king suddenly shows his face. He tells Merthofan that he has been using him all this while and finally releases him. The king confessed he was the one who had the humans attack his village. He walks up to him, places his hand on his head, and turns him into a monster that will forever serve him. Riho and Selena find a way to distract Merthofan, who's now a monster. The princess follows the king and attempts to fight him, but the king is stronger than her. As she summons up the courage to defeat the king, she realizes that he is the demon lord Abat. Chief Alka and Lloyd were at the festival. After some time, Lloyd tells the chief that he needs to be somewhere. He adds that even if he angers Miss Marie, even if she stops him or if he's too weak, that cannot stop him from going. Back at the palace, Marie was shocked to realize that the culprit was a demon king. But suddenly, it all dawned on her that the chief had made a statement saying that villagers of Kunlun only assist when the threat is beyond human comprehension, like a demon lord or some epic disaster. Marie runs away from the demon lord, wishing she had known about this long ago. The chief would have intervened, 
Somewhere in the middle of a street, Lloyd runs to find Marie. Along the way, he met a startled soldier frightened and hiding away from a giant locust, but Lloyd killed the locust in seconds, which made the scared soldier wonder what sort of strength he had, but Lloyd encouraged him saying he was stronger than him, and that all he had to do was face his fears. At the palace, Chrome, the cafeteria owner, fights Merthafan who was turned by the demon lord. He fought alongside Riho and Selen, but his strength is unmatched with theirs, as he beats all of them. Riho tells Selen they must make excuses so Lloyd can rescue them. Selen agrees with her, but she steps forward. Merthofan tries to hit her, but the belt is blocked, which was enchanted by Lloyd's magic spells. The belt princess is excited, and informs them that the belt is the tie that binds her fate to Sir Lloyd's. Riho tells Selen to keep Merthofan occupied, while she goes to fetch Lloyd. But as she runs to look for Lloyd, she finds him running towards them. Lloyd is glad everyone is okay. He goes ahead to face Merthofan, and asks him why he's doing this as a soldier. Lloyd tells him that to his understanding, a soldier is someone who protects the livelihoods, the smiles, and the peaceful days of everyday people. Lloyd continues to talk to Colonel Merthafan, asking him what was on his mind the very day he decided to be a soldier. Merthafan realizes himself and admits that he wants to make a world free of war, free of despair. As they kept talking, they all thought of the princess and wondered where she was. Lloyd runs to the door to find her, but the princess is already running towards them. She hugged Lloyd and said she was happy to see him. The demon lord walks in. Lloyd took a piece of cloth bound by an ancient rune and wiped the face of the demon lord. When it was finally over, Lloyd went over to the princess and observed that her hands were bruised from the fight with the demon lord. He brought the piece of cloth and cleaned her hands. Marie hugged him again and thanked him for saving her life. Lloyd is back on the streets of the city. A lot of things had happened, but he was happy the festival went well. Buried in his thoughts, he lifted his face and was surprised to see that Shoma, his elder brother, was right in front of him. Lloyd runs and embraces him. He asks Shoma what he was doing at Azami, and he replies that he came to deliver some goods for the festival stalls. Shoma exclaims of how big Lloyd had gotten and that he took down Abaddon. Shoma admits that he was surprised, but it was intense. Just then, Chief Alpha runs Lloyd with a banana chocolate and apologizes to him for keeping him waiting all alone. But they later realize that Shoma has left and is nowhere to be seen. Chrome, the cafeteria owner, is now dressed in a soldier's uniform. He was recruited. Colonel Cholin asks if the Mirth fan was the reason why he decided to join them. Colonel Chrome explains to her that more or less, he's responsible for not being able to stop him. Colonel Choline wonders where Merthafan is, but Chrome informs her that the royal family decided to send him to the outskirts to do hard labor in an environment full of monsters. Chief Alka tells Merthafan that his next task is to work on the wheat farm. She tells him that a while back, the locust demon lord caused a famine all over the continent. She revealed to him that she used runes to breed a form of wheat that can grow year-round. She lets out that she got tired after passing it around the whole continent. Chief Alka visits Marie and asks her if she's returning to the castle anytime soon. She replies that her father is recovering and should be able to rule again soon. She adds that she was used to life there and has decided not to go back to being a princess again. Lloyd was finally recruited into the academy. He was given his soldier uniform. The girls congratulated him on his first step towards his dreams. Marie wondered who got Lloyd into the academy, as she heard someone had suggested Selene and the others. Lloyd introduces Riho and Selene to Chief Alka, saying they were his friends. Chief Alka observes that she wore a belt that can protect her from any evil. It is a legendary artifact from the village of Kunlun that protects its wearer from all evil. Mr. Allen from the academy shows up while the ladies are discussing with Lloyd. Lloyd tells them it was him that put him into the academy, but Mr. Allen insists he wants to thank him because he helped him the other day of that monster attack. He explains that he had worked out that day and the superior wanted to reward him. He tells them that he didn't want to impose, but he had suggested bringing Sir Lloyd into the academy. Marie, the princess alongside Chrome and Lloyd, are out to pick up trash. They stumbled on a strange man's yard. There was a big magical sword in a rock by the strange man's yard. Chrome confirms that it is the holy sword that cannot be removed unless you have a high degree of magical power. But Lloyd pulled it out, which made the man stare in awe. The man lamented that Lloyd had ruined his business ventures, as the spot served as the Holy Sword Forest campsite, Holy Sword Forest golf course, museum, and park. Marie tells them that it is settled. Chrome asks the princess what they do with the sword, and she replies that the mayor will probably make a fake replica, so they have to announce that it's been pulled as soon as possible. At the academy, Lloyd and his friends are just done with physical training. They all lament how tired they are, except Lloyd who thinks it was fun. Rio consoles herself saying that the next training is magi theory, and hopefully she'll rest while listening. Just then, Colonel Chlorine walks into the class 
and addresses them saying, there will be no theory classes starting from that day. She informs them that they'll be doing practical lessons instead, and that she'll be picking candidates for the upcoming inter-school match against Rakuju Sorcery Academy. Mr. Allen explains to them that inter-school matches are an event done annually, and that Azami has been on a losing streak for the past few years. Lloyd encourages them that they'll win this time for sure. The soldiers are gathered outside the field as the colonel teaches them magic practice. She explains that there are three major types of magic. The first is chance, where one utters words. The second is sigils, where you inscribe pictures and texts. The last is conduits, where one uses magical stones and staves. Each has its pros and cons, so it's best to use them all flexibly. After explaining the theory, they started practicing. After the training, Selen approaches Colonel Chlorine and tells her she'd like to learn healing magic, as she heard she was an expert in that field. The colonel asks her why she wants to learn so badly, and she replies that she wants to heal the wounds of somebody dear to deepen their bonds. Riho overhears them and tells her that healing magic is the hardest and that lots of people underestimate it and quickly give up. She further explains that also, so much can go wrong. One can close a wound with pebbles or dirt still inside, causing it to fester and require surgery all over again. Mr. Allen approaches them to join in the discussion. He asks them that if it was so hard, it should give them more reason to start learning about it sooner. Lloyd is encouraged and determined to learn it too. After concluding the discussion, the colonel suggests that they do a Cholene's healing boot camp session. She informs them that they'll need an injured person. Selene kicks Mr. Allen and makes him fall. He injured himself in the process, but Colonel Chirine assures him that she'll fix him right up no matter how much pain he goes through. Marie is in her home taking some tea and reading a book when two ladies enter her room. She is startled and asks them who they are. They apologize for startling her and introduce themselves as Mina Quinine and Philo Quinine. They are sisters. Marie asks them if they are the mercenary sisters of Rokuju. They agreed and informed Marie that they were students there too. Marie asks the sisters what they want, and they bring out a picture of a girl saying they were looking for her. From Marie's expression, they could tell Marie knew her. But just then, Lloyd returns from training. He glances at the picture Quinine is holding and tells her she's Miss Riho. He adds that they both attend the same academy. Filio approaches Lloyd and requests that she be his apprentice. She tells him that she'll cook, clean, and dispose of his foes. Lloyd turns down their request, saying that it is Marie's house and he can't take them in. After some time, Chief Alka appears and tells Marie she heard she took a trip to the Holy Sword Village, but answers that they were just passing by. At the Academy, Chromie knew the interstate match was coming up soon, and since they're working so hard, maybe he'll set up some kind of freeze. Riho asks Colonel Florine why she wants to win so badly but she replies saying that it's because the snake woman she hates just became headmaster of Rokuju. Suddenly, the snake woman shows up and asks if they are talking about her. The colonel asks what she is doing there as the matches don't start anytime soon. The snake woman walks up to Riho and tells her that she's been looking for her and that she's glad her arms are okay too. Selene asks the colonel who the strange lady is. Colonel Florine answers that her name is Rol Kalsik, her classmate back at Rokiju. She played politics to kick her rivals out to become the number one and finally climbed up to headmaster. Rol whispers to Rio's ears, telling her to come home unless she wants to lose even more things dear to her. Rol tells her that she'll hear her response on the day of the match. At dinner, in Marie's home, Lloyd tells her there's someone he needs to cheer up, but that he doesn't know what to do. Marie suggests that if it's a woman, then he can ask her to join him for tea and have a real date. Lloyd tells Marie that he wonders if anyone would enjoy going on a date with a weak, dull boy like him. Marie replies that he just has to be passionate and drag her out if he has to. Lloyd thanks Miss Marie for her advice and concludes that he'll ask Riho on a date the following day. Lloyd then approaches Riho and asks her out on a date. They went to a cafeteria where he ordered donuts, but Rio is quiet the entire time. Lloyd wonders if she doesn't like donuts. Lloyd asks her to tell him what happened. He observed that she looked depressed after what happened the other day. Rio starts narrating that she lived in an orphanage, and that's where she met Rol. Rol has a knack for magic, and she taught her a lot of magic too, but because of her left hand, she couldn't do anything to support the orphanage. Then one day, when Rock came home, she was holding a mithril prosthetic arm. She was so happy and thought she could finally earn some money for the orphanage and that she could work side by side with Roll, but she ran away. The reason why Roll gave her that arm was to use the power of the mithril to boost her magic abilities. Then in exchange for her life, she could pull out the holy sword. Riho explains that no one can touch her mithril with bare hands as it'll suck the magic out of that person. She further explains that it was like a plant with its roots in her 
constantly sucking away her magic powers, which is why she has to keep running away. No matter how many fake crimes she puts out warrants her, Lloyd touches her hands and assures her that she can trust him and that he'll never betray her. The interstate match is about to start, and Colonel Chrome announces that the special prizes for the winners are a cash award and the legendary Holy Sword. As the interstate match begins, the instructor addresses the contestants that they will fight one-on-one. -on -one. The first team to win twice wins the match. They can equip anything for defense, but may only attack with magic items, kike staves, and magic stones. Physical attacks like punching or kicking are prohibited and will lead to immediate disqualification. The referee calls on the first competitors to step forward. Selene and Filio step forward. They were told to begin. Filio uses stone magic to cast on her opponent Selene, but she hopes the belt will protect her from all sorts of evil. To her greatest surprise, the belt did not work. Philip tries the thunder and flame magic in Selene, but the magic was condoned by her belt. Selena tells Filio that it's time for her counterattacks. She controls the belt and makes it tie Filio, but the referee blew the whistle and disqualified her for breaking the rules of not using physical attacks on the opponent. Filio was then declared the winner of the round. The students of Rokuju shouted joyously as they won the first round, but Colonel Chirin encouraged her team saying that a loss is a loss and that they mustn't dwell on it. The next round of the fight is between Lloyd and Mina. Mina used water magic to suppress Lloyd so he could give up, but Lloyd withstood the magic. She then pulls up an aqua fall magic on Lloyd, a wall of water and fog magic, defense and distraction. But Lloyd falls on the water and can counter Mina's magic, forcing her to self-destruct. Lloyd was declared the winner of the round. The final round is between Rill and Riho. Riho uses the magic coming from her mithril to fight Roll, but Riho tries to get Riho to run out of magic powers. Riho stood strong, which made Roll take the mithril hand off her. Miss Riho falls to the ground and weakens. She asks what Rill has done to her. Roll replied that she put the arm on her so she could take it off. Before Roll realized it, Riho used a chant magic and threw her off her balance. Roll is surprised and is wondering what just happened, but Riho explains that the person who once taught her magic used to say that if you cast healing magic on a wound with foreign objects still inside, it could seal up the wound and leave the object inside the body. And since she couldn't tell from the outside that there was something inside, she had to be careful. It was obvious that Riho had planted a magic stone in her arm and cast a healing spell over it. Riho also cast a delayed action heal as well. Riho was declared the winner of the round. Riho and Selene were in the hospital, so the sword was given to Lloyd. This bit of information was also given to Roll by her student, but she replies that as much as she'd like to take it from him, she couldn't in her current state. The spy narrated to her that he had gotten intel on the person responsible for pulling out the holy sword. He explains that it's a shady character called the Witch of the East Side. The spy informs Roll that this witch lives with a younger brother type that she's overprotective of. Roll instructs Mina to bring to her at once this boy, which the witch is overprotective. Lloyd got home and found out that Miss Marie wasn't in there. Instead, he found a note saying they had something of his that was precious to him. To get them back, he has to stake the legendary sword by all means necessary. The note also says he should bring the sword to the lighthouse on the south side. Lloyd and Alan run towards the lighthouse but are faced by Philo, who picks up a fight with Lloyd. He suggests that they do an armrest lay to settle the duel. Philo finally agrees to it. Lloyd entrusted the sword to Mr. Alan while he went on to arm wrestle Philo. As Alan hides behind a street, Roll's spy faces Alan and asks him to surrender the sword, but he refuses. Mina came to Alan's rescue. She tells them she has come to fight against Roll, as she said bad things about her sister, like she was some kind of tool. She had overheard them talk while they thought she was fast asleep. It's night time. A man is lying on the ground. Mina and Philo are standing over him. They are relieved that he is still alive. They contemplate the cause of his unconsciousness and conclude they will carry out the assignment because it carries a nice bonus. While picking him up, Mina and Philo discuss what to eat. They have to go to the infirmary first. In the morning, Lloyd picks up books. Rio approaches him. She wants to know if he is interested in going horse racing with her during the long break. Selene appears behind her. This startles her. Selene is complaining that she will not have her lovey-dovey vacation with Lloyd because her family has summoned her. She considers setting her family house ablaze, but Lloyd declines honorably and says he has other plans. She even asks him if he will get married to her. Riho, frustrated, tells her she is being ridiculous and they start dissing each other about asking Lloyd on dates. While they banter words with each other, Alan interrupts them. He keeps exclaiming to himself. When asked, 
He says he has a formal marriage interview to attend during the vacation and will not be available to support Sir Lloyd. He seems excited about it. At this point, Selene and Riho take Lloyd out while telling him Alan only wants to get their attention. Lloyd is home. He meets Marie and Chief in a brawl. He tells them he will be going away to do a live-in, part-time job. This ends the fight between them abruptly. Lloyd adds that Mr. Chrome introduced him to a big hotel where he wants to help with cleaning and cooking. They try to convince him to stay, but he insists. Then Chief and Marie decide they want to join him, but he convinces them that he needs to learn to rely on himself. The next scene opens with Koba Lamine contemplating the arrival of the part-time staff. Suddenly Lloyd appears behind him, startling him. They introduce themselves. Koba Lamine introduces himself as the owner of the hotel, and Lloyd introduces himself as the part-time employee. Koba was the leader of the Royal Guard in the Azami Royal Army. Koba shows Lloyd around and informs him of their problem at the hotel. According to him, People have been found in a comatose state, and they have been unable to figure out why. Koba had sought help from the government, through Chrome, and had also mentioned needing part-time staff. Lloyd offers to help with the problem. In another room of the hotel, a girl is hiding behind a pillar. It's Kikyu. Koba calls out to her, and introduces her to Lloyd as his senior colleague. Koba hands Lloyd over to Kikyu. She gives him a brush right away to begin cleaning. As she begins giving him a lecture about being a good employee with her eyes closed, Lloyd cleans the room. He is as quick as lightning. Kikyu is shocked. She keeps screaming, while Koba comes back in. The bright light from the now clean skylights enters his eye. He is very impressed that Lloyd is already done cleaning. He hands Lloyd his uniform and takes him away for his next task. Lloyd's next task is to receive an important guest, Lord Threonine. Lord Threonine has arrived. Koba and Lloyd welcome him, while he admires the cypress, drinking wine. Lord Threonine spots Lloyd, and asks what he thinks of the cypress forest. Lloyd replies that, although beautiful, turning the cypress forest into a sightseeing center, feels like a waste. He goes on and on, about how it is perfectly planted. Lord Threonine is interested in Lloyd's knowledge of pruning. They discuss the dangers of turning the forest into a national treasure. Lord Threonine is impressed. Lloyd shares his point of view. Koba gives Lloyd a thumbs up. He is impressed. At night, Kikyu comes over to meet Threonine. They discuss the comatose victims. Threonine suggests they are treant attacks. He tells her they must investigate before the forest is declared a national treasure. When asked why he has arrived early, Threonine replies that he has some good intel. First, he says a local lord wants to arrange marriage for his son, and that this local lord has been buying treants recently and making a fortune. According to Threonine, when a treant is defeated, it leaves behind high-quality lumber that can be sold legally. He adds that the trade volume is too large and that he needs to obtain evidence through his son. Second, he says a parasitic treant sapling called the Demon Lord Seedling was stolen from a monster research lab and brought there by a merchant. He mentions that the physical strength of a host infected by the treant sapling is amplified and allows for distant travel. Kikyu recalls Lloyd's lightning-fast cleaning. She tells him about it. Threonine hands over a jar of herbal medication to her, advising her to rub it on Lloyd or mix it in his food to expel the Trent from his body. In the next scene, Kikyu presents Lloyd with a cup of tea laced with the medication. Before Lloyd can drink it, Koba barges in. He orders Lloyd to take some rest, and Lloyd leaves. Koba, noticing Kikyu with the tea, grabs it and drinks. He immediately spits it out while choking. He screams at her while she jumps out the window. As he looks out the window, he speaks in his thoughts. He thinks Kikyu is a suspect in the comatose cases. It's morning. Riho is admiring her room in the hotel. She orders something from the front desk. Lloyd brings it to her. They are both surprised to see each other. He talks to her about investigating something in the hotel. What she ordered was a massage, and Lloyd is to give it to her. Riho screams at the top of her lungs at the thought of this. She does not want a man touching her body. On the other hand, Selene arrives at the hotel with her father. She is supposed to attend a marriage meeting with an army elite. It's Alan. Despite Selene's attempt to dodge the meeting, her father takes her with him. Selene and her father are seated with Lord Threonine. Before Alan arrives, Selene contemplates killing him to prove her love for Lloyd. The door opens, and Lloyd walks in. Selene is mad with joy. She had been expecting Alan. She jumps on him and takes him out of the room with her. Selene's father and Threonine settle to discuss. Selene is still on top of Lloyd, expressing her feelings. Miss Riho comes in pulling her by the head off of him. They tell her why Alan never showed up instead. Alan was found in a pool. His eyes looked abnormal, 
The hotel staff tried to wake him, but he lay unconscious, mumbling to himself. He was then taken to the infirmary. Because of that, Brionine asked Lloyd to stand in for Alan, while Riho stood in for Lloyd. Selen suggests she and Lloyd disguise themselves as dates and investigate what is going on, while Riho investigates on the inside. As an employee, Lloyd agrees. Selene and Lloyd are by the lake. Selen appears disappointed at Lloyd's way of acting as her date. She comments on the beauty of the lake and forces him to tell her she is more beautiful. Rio comes to his rescue and pushes her to the ground. At the hotel, Koba is suspicious of Threonine. He wants to investigate why Lloyd is standing in for Alan. On the other hand, Selene, Riho, and Lloyd are together refreshing their plans. Selene is still stuck with her feelings for Lloyd. While they discuss, someone riding a horse calls out to Riho, since she is putting on a staff uniform. Lloyd recognizes him. It's Shoma. Shoma tells the trio he got a huge order for firebombs from the hotel. Riho suspects Selene. Lloyd introduces Shoma to the ladies. He says they live together in Kunlun. Shoma asks them to take care of the delivery for him. But Selene takes Lloyd away with her and instructs Riho on how to take care of it. Next, Lloyd and Selene explore different dates. Selene is all over him. While on a boat, she tells him about her belt. She says it was part of her father's antique collection and bound itself to her face at first. It infuriates her that right after the belt comes off, her father is trying to set her up with Alan. While Lloyd doubts his ability to succeed in anything on his own, Selene encourages and assures him. She promises to keep the discussion a secret and is excited about her marriage to Lloyd again. In the bushes, Kiku is watching Lloyd and Selene. She waits for an opportunity and rushes over to Lloyd just when Selene is out of the way. Lloyd is having a foot bath and immediately feels someone around him. He sees Kikyu and asks what she wants. She tells him she wants to give him a massage and takes out the herbal medication. He agrees. Lloyd is bare-chested now. While Kikyu applies the medication to his back and chest, nothing happens, much to her shock. She wonders where the treant parasite is. As she takes her hand into his trousers, Selene appears and strikes her with her belt, sending her flying. They begin to fight. Selene uses her belt, while Kikyu demonstrates her swiftness. When Lloyd notices he is no longer being massaged, he comes over to the girls. While Selene appears smitten by his half-naked body, Kikyu takes the opportunity to escape. Selene suggests she and Lloyd take a hot spring bath together. He agrees. In the next scene, Lloyd is in the hot spring. Before Selene can get in, Riho comes along, in a towel as well. Selene furiously questions her about what she wants. Again, Alka and Miss Marie also come out to join the hot spring much to everyone's amazement. Mina shows up as well as Philo. Mina says she has been hired by the Amazi Kingdom and introduces Philo as their classmate. Philo tells them she plans to become Lloyd's apprentice and future wife. In the now crowded hot spring, Mina explains that she is investigating the incidents happening at the hotel. She adds that she has also been sent to investigate illegal treant cultivation. Alka tells Lloyd that she thinks the treants are the cause of the comatose victims and asks him to do something about it. She also introduces herself to Selene as the chief of Kunlun. In the bushes, Kikyu watches. She notices the throw, but then, Rianine's secretary, Minoki, spots her. She notices he has been infested by a trent. He laughs at her, saying he grew trents all over Threonine's favorite mountain, despite him for abusing him. He says he used the Hamine family, which opposes Threonine. As he speaks, branches sprout out of his body. Kikyu wonders what could be the reason for Lloyd's lightning speed cleaning. Suddenly, she notices Minoki has entangled her legs with his branches. He claims he will conquer the world with his new power. As he speaks, Lloyd shows up. He is looking for Alka. He thinks Minoki is putting on a costume. Minoki becomes annoyed and summons other treats. At the hotel, Selen's father and Threonine are still discussing the Treant's case. Koba is there too. He finally lets out that the comatose cases began when Threonine started visiting the hotel. Back in the bushes, Lloyd succeeds in taking out the Treant's, much to Kikyu's shock. Lloyd still thinks Minoki is wearing a costume while Minoki walks, in his transformed self, in the direction of the hotel. The people in the hot spring are the first to notice. Selen's father tells Threonine he is in business with the Lidocaine family, Threonine's family. Threonine did not know of this. He is furious. Selen's father goes on to describe the representative for the Lidocaine family that came up. The description matches Minoki. Threonine calls out for the secretary. At that moment, Minoki shows up, now like a large tree. He breaks through the window and charges towards them. When he tries to attack them, Mina and Philo stop him but they soon realize their magic does not work on him. Riho, Selene, and Marie are there as well. Riho asks Selene to distract him while she leaves. In the commotion, a large brick falls on Selene's father, 
while he pushes her out of its way. Ryo arrives at the location of the firebombs Shoma had brought earlier. Alan is there. He is now conscious. She and Alan begin throwing firebombs at Minoki. They use their magic to trap him while he resists. Lloyd helps Selen's father out from beneath the rock and asks her to take him somewhere safe. Marie tells Lloyd he is the only one who can strike the core of the monster Minoki became. Lloyd surges towards the trapped monster and strikes its core, taking out the demon seedling and destroying it. Minoki is himself again. Shoma is in the bushes, watching. Alka is there with him. She is conscious and realizes she has been buried. Shoma says he did it to protect her from the cold. However, he does not take her out and admits to working with that man. The next scene shows Alka complaining about being tired. She has been altering people's memories and healing the wounded. Koba and Threonin also apologize to each other. Selene's father, too, apologizes to her and promises to support her. He entrusts her to Lloyd's care. Selene is excited and hugs Lloyd passionately, again speaking of the marriage between them. The first scene opens with Shoma walking with a girl. He brings her to a silver-haired man. He asks her what he looks like to her and she replies by asking him if he isn't a priest. She wants revenge for someone who took her love from her. The man directs Shoma to give her some items to make her powerful. There are two items. One is treant medicine. She gulps it, and it makes her grow wings and feel powerful. It's morning. Lloyd serves food to Marie. She wants him to feed her. Before he can, Selen appears. She stuffs her belt into Marie's mouth and chokes her with the rest of it. Philo and Rio show up. They have come to pick up Lloyd at the castle. They have orders from the king to hunt a huge snake in a dark dungeon. As cadets, they all have to go. Selene is excited to just be close to Lloyd. The Azami royal family welcomes them. Alan is here too. They begin to educate them about the snake. According to witnesses, it is at the lowest level. The other Azami army is to provide security around the dungeon. Shoma and the silver-haired man from earlier are seated and drinking tea. They are talking about someone. The man says the person is in a nearby dungeon and is being hunted. The man wants to destroy this person before someone else gets to him. Alpha watches them. At the entrance of the dungeon, Lloyd thanks Riho, Philo, and Selen for their help, promising to do his best. The girls argue about who he is talking to directly. Alan wants to also guard the outside of the dungeon. The girls tease him about being scared. He screams in the negative. Marie is walking down a street, contemplating. She worries about Lloyd. Out of nowhere, Alka startles her from behind. She wants to know if there is a nearby dungeon. She grabs Marie along with her, so she can show her where it is. Now in the dungeon, Lloyd and his team walk quietly. Philo and Selin confront Rio. They want to know if she has feelings for Lloyd, while they question her. They all hear the building shake. Everyone thinks it is a giant snake. However, it is Marie and Alka. They have fallen through. Alka immediately breaks through a wall, leaving Marie behind. Marie, heading in another direction, stumbles on something. She thinks it is the snake. It is a treat. At the core of the trant is the girl from earlier, who had gulped down the items given by Shoma. Marie recognizes her and calls out to her. She is Makona. Makona tells Marie she is waiting to take revenge on someone who took her love away. When asked, she says the person is Lloyd Belladonna. Makona refuses to mention who her lover is. She uses one of her tentacles to wrap around Marie. She apologizes and says she is doing it to get Marie to get Lloyd to come. The plan works. Marie calls out to Lloyd and he comes rushing in. Now, Makona asks Lloyd to fight her. She tightens the tentacle around Marie and uses other tentacles to fight Lloyd. She uses all her power to send Lloyd crashing into the wall. Next, she scratches his face around the wall, but Lloyd succeeds in pushing her away from him. Due to the commotion, Riho, Selene, and Philo come running in. This distracts Lloyd and Makona can wound him with her tentacles. Weak and wounded, Lloyd declares to Makona that he will not accept defeat and work hard till he becomes a soldier like his friends. Makona is infuriated. She charges towards him with all her energy. Because of this, the dungeon walls begin to collapse. They fall through to the last level. Lloyd succeeds in sending Makona flying through the walls and outside the dungeon. It is over. Lloyd is weak. His friends come rushing towards him. They are impressed, but before they can celebrate their win, the giant snake appears from underneath the ground. He recognizes Lloyd and introduces himself as Vritra, the guardian beast of Kunlun. According to him, he protects magical seals and maintains Alka's powers. The beast is furious with Alka for trying to make an apron out of his skin once by using Excalibur to carve his skin. Marie begins contemplating if the snake gave the treant to Makona, but the silver-haired man walks in. He asks what Lloyd sees him as, and Lloyd replies that he sees him as a bad man. Because of this, the man recognizes Lloyd as the one. Soon after, Alka breaks through the dungeon grounds to get to where they are. She recognizes the silver-haired man 
as so. Su then goes towards Vritra to eliminate him. He says he has been after Vritra for so long. Next, he digs his hand deep into Vritra's skin. He says if he eliminates Vritra, then Kunlun's seal will be broken. Su eliminates Vritra. With Vritra gone, Su is excited that Alka's powers are gone. To his surprise, Alka charges towards him and knocks him down. She then informs them all that she made an apron out of Vritra's skin and sold it off because she mistakenly cut it up while making pasta. The apron is Selin's belt. Sue disappears with magic while Alan and a few of the guards outside charge in, sensing commotion. While going in, they come across a figure with purple light. He recalls having to defend Lloyd, and it motivates him. Alan uses his hatchet to strike the figure, and the building begins to collapse again. Alka lets out a crystal ball to use as an escape for them all. In the next scene, the Azami king addresses the soldiers. He is thankful for their work. He wants to reward them. Alan refuses a reward. Because of this, the king grants him the title of Dragon Slayer to honor his achievements, surprising Alan. Now in the room alone, Lloyd cannot help but remember Sue. He picks up his book, realizing the protagonist in the book has the same name as Sue. He suspects it is not a coincidence. It is nighttime. The group of friends are celebrating. Alka shows up. She causes a sack to cover up Silent and tells them all she will be taking them to Kunlun. The group exclaims in shock. The Azami king has received news. There is going to be an exhibition match between Azami and Ju. He is addressing the soldiers. He thinks it will be a good idea to let the world know that the relationship between the two nations has normalized. He decides he will send the most legendary tough guy. Lloyd and his friends, Riho, Selen, and Philo, are on the way to Kunlun with Alka. They are currently walking in the forest. Alka says a dwarf is waiting up ahead for them, and they will have to reunite with her. The dwarf, first. The ladies are all excited about the trip to Kunlun. Selen, on her part, believes she can now be introduced to Lloyd's family. At this point, Marie breaks the news that the trip to Kunlun is to fix Vritra. Mr. Chrome and Choline are with them as well. According to them, they have presented Alan to the king to fight in the exhibition match between Azami and Jiu, much to Alan's displeasure. He is the legendary tough guy the king referred to. They arrive at a cave. In the cave, there is a portal, where Alka calls out to someone named Yug to come out. A blue-haired girl comes out from the portal. She introduces herself as Professor Yug and adds that she is dwarven royalty. They are surprised she is called a dwarf, and even more surprised when she adds that she is in her hundreds. Yug then starts to banter words with Alka, and Alka reveals that creating the apron out of Ritra's skin was Yug's idea, much to the shock of the whole team. They then use the portal to go to Kunlun. They reappear at a large landmass. They take turns admiring the surroundings, while some of them are a bit disappointed at how Kunlun looks. Arriving at a fountain, Mr. Chrome, Riho, and Philo become tense. Mr. Chrome says he is getting deadly vibes from everywhere. Just then, they spot a family of three, who have the same lightning-quick abilities as Lloyd. Also, an arrow flies past them. Still to their shock, an older lady takes out a paper with a message from the arrow. She replies in the paper, puts a small rock inside it, and sends it flying across a mountain at the speed of light. Everyone except Lloyd is wide-mouthed. He informs them that that is their way of communicating. The woman recognizes Lloyd. They greet themselves. Her name is Mrs. Locomo. Again, an older man calls on Mrs. Locomo to help with some magic on a piece of equipment that resembles an artillery. With her help, he is sent flying across the mountain. Although she misses them, Lloyd explains that they fly like that when they are in a hurry. Next, a man carrying what Riho describes as a killer piranha approaches them. He recognizes Lloyd, too. Philo bows to him, recognizing him as Pirit, the Ogre Lord. She reveals that she is a practitioner of the Pirid style and would love to be instructed by him. Much to her surprise, she discovers the Pirid style she has been practicing is an aerobics exercise. He agrees to instruct her, while Riho agrees to help him with the piranha. She discovers it is very heavy. They arrive at Alka's mansion. Chrome and Choline rush off to the wheat field behind Alka's home. On instruction, they are looking for someone. There is a man. Choline calls out to him. His name is Murthafan. He has silver hair and a scar underneath his eyes. He is muscular too. He welcomes them. He tells Choline about using feces as fertilizer, much to her displeasure. She punches him twice in the face, even. When Chrome asks Murthafan why he came back to Kunlun, he replies that he participated in an attempted coup and so cannot go back. He also enjoys farming in Kunlun. Back at Alka's house, Mr. Gore and Kuman welcome Loy. Selen, believing they are Lloyd's family, formally introduces herself as Selen Hemane and presents them all with her Mariagi registration forms. She tells them she intends to marry Lloyd. Before she can complete the statement, the house begins to shake. Alka says it is a certain pest. Barry tells them it is the flying lizard, 
while Riho goes out to handle it. She meets a large dragon and runs off. The dragon chases her. Barry and Kuman come to the rescue. They make paper jets out of the paper Selen shared with them and send them flying towards the dragon. Selen realizes they just used her marriage registration forms and screams in shock. Meanwhile, the duo thanks her for the papers while carrying the horn inside. It's time for dinner. Alka begins by welcoming everyone to her marriage to Lloyd. Selene and the other ladies look at her angrily. Although Pyrid claims it is a joke, she disagrees. He goes ahead and welcomes Lloyd and his friends. Then they dig in. The guests are excited about the food. They all claim it is delicious, but when told the origins of each plate, they do not think so anymore, but still eat anyway. Rio assists with the cleaning. Pyrid and the other villagers are set to leave. Lloyd thanks them for coming. They ask him who his girlfriend is among the girls. Tensed, Lloyd cannot produce an answer. They begin choosing for him. Aunt Sulfra suggests Riho because she helped with cleaning. Here it suggests Philo because he thinks she's got good moves in the pirate style. Selene is furious. No one picked her. She asks Vritra for help. He suggests she impress the kids with the talking belt gimmick. In the next scene, Alka and Yug are discussing. Yug says, it's time for something but is discouraged by Alka. She says, she doesn't want a repeat of the last time. Yug expresses her concern about what Vritra will do when he regains his memory. Alka pleads with her to wait a little longer. A furious Selene is lying on her bed and mumbling to herself her belt curled up in a corner. Riho screams at her to shut up, and they begin exchanging words. Selene is jealous that Riho was picked, and even given expensive clothes to change into. Realizing how expensive they are, Riho takes off the clothes. Just then, Lloyd walks in with snacks for them. He is wide-mouthed at Riho's naked self. Philo immediately kicks him out the window. She then ties Riho up as punishment. In another room, Mirthafan apologizes to Marie for something he did. Choline and Chrome are here too. She asks him how he ended up being manipulated. According to him, a traveling merchant gave him a mysterious and sinister egg to present to the king, and he did. From that moment on, he stopped worrying about the consequences of his actions and was driven by a strange impulse. Marie asks him to describe the merchant, but he cannot. Cholina suspects the merchant is the culprit behind the demon lord, who was manipulating her father. Just then, Mirthapan remembers the merchant asking him, what he looked like to him. Realization sets in on them all. It was so. It is morning in Kunlun. Alka, Marie, Yu, Lloyd, and his friends are walking through a forest. They want to resurrect Vritra's body. Lloyd and Riho are walking nervously together. Yu asks if something transpired between them the previous night. The duo does not hesitate to scream that nothing happened. Vritra is furious that Alka is not treating his resurrection as important. They arrive at their destination. Yuge informs them that it is the last dungeon. The last dungeon is described as the prison at the end of the world. It resembles an ordinary building. Riho, on the other hand, thinks there could be rare treasures inside. Alka corrects her, saying that they are demon lords instead. Yuge educates them about the last dungeon. She says the other ones they had encountered were decoys built by the dwarves and used to hide the last dungeon. Alka adds that, as residents of Kunlun, their job is to defeat any demon lord that makes it out of there. Even Lloyd does not know this. Yug explains Vritra's function. He guards Alka and Kunlun. Yug adds that whenever Alka takes damage, she can transfer it to Vritra, and this makes her able to harness the power of the place. Yug goes on to explain that, in the last dungeon, there is something that affects the global collective subconscious to make people think that is how things work. She explains that they used that, and, through ancient texts and fairy tales, made Alka and the others. This leaves them even more confused. Marie then lets them know that Alka forgot all about the rules, went ahead to skin Vritra, and thus caused all the problems they had out of negligence. Alka tries to defend herself by telling them it was Yuji's idea to make the apron out of Vritra's skin. Yug dismisses her. Yug divulges that if they were to insert the key, the holy sword, then all the demon lords would be set free. Choline and Chrome jump in shock. They recall using the holy sword as a prize. Chrome informs Yug that the sword is in the kingdom's treasury. Vritra parts with Selen, ready for his resurrection. They begin. Yug clicks her wrist and an open kitchen appears. She takes some boneless ribs, which she says will serve as the base. She pounds, rolls, and wraps it with Vritra to keep it from losing shape. Then she sears it in a frying pan, till it's brown. Next, she lets the meat rest and prepares some sauce made of soy sauce, cooking alcohol, sliced ginger, and green onions. Also, she adds a special culture solution. Later, she purifies the meat still wrapped in Vritra and tosses it in an egg. She then boils the egg at a high temperature and stews it for about three hours over low heat. In three hours, when the pot is opened, purple fog erupts, encircling them. It clears up to reveal the egg. Yug calls for Alka and taps her on the forehead. She is weakened. Yug says this has successfully cut Alka off from the last dungeon, 
and will give her the stamina of a nine-year-old. The ritual is complete. They all plan to return to Azami to watch the exhibition match immediately. Before they leave, Yug takes Alka aside. They walk through the forest alone. While Alka babbles about how she will take advantage of her new weakness to make Lloyd take care of her, Yug steps on a kind of button on the ground. Suddenly, the ground beneath Alka opens up, and she falls in. Overcome with shock, Alka asks Yug what she is doing. Yug declares war. She says that now that she knows where the Holy Sword is, she just needed to pretend to resurrect Vritra, but she sealed him instead. She adds that the world needs to be rebuilt, and that she is working with Su and Shoma. After this betrayal, she seals Alka in. Yuj comes over to the portal, where everyone else except Lloyd is. She encourages them to go on without Lloyd. She gives a reason why she needs to discuss something with him. They leave. Lloyd then rushes over moments later. He meets only Yug there. Yug asks him if he has seen Alka. He replies in the negative. He runs off to try to look for her. Yug encourages him. Riho and the others are now out of the cave. Yug is here with them too. To their surprise, Mirthafan also joins them. This startles Yug. Mirthafan informs them he just needs to give some vegetables to Marie and will be going back on his own immediately. Yug lets him know she has shut the portal behind her. She says that she had to leave Lloyd behind to keep Alka quiet. Philo and Salen are crying in regret while Choline grabs Mirthafen with her, running off and leaving Chrome alone to set up the exhibition match. On their way back, Riho is excited to sell off the clothes she was given in Kunlun. Yuk wants to buy it from here. She even wants to fix up Riho's arm for her. Riho decides she will think about it first. She ends up selling it to someone else and is impressed by the amount of money it is worth. While she is contemplating selling the panties too, Mina approaches her. They discuss Kun Lun, and Mina says she is on patrol. Mina and Riho visit Roll. Mina offers her some shish kebab. Roll is writing a book, How to Take Out a Rival, Workplace Edition. She says it is a book of tips on how to survive as a weak person in the world. Riho then asks her about the person who told her to get the holy sword. She replies that she only remembers that the person asked her what he looked like to her. She says she also thinks he was with a small child who was making a sound like it was sucking on something. Rio believes it is Yug. Back at the castle, Alan informs Riho and Mina that the kings of Azami and Jiu are coming to check on the stadium, and he will need them to run a security check on the area. He takes Cholin with him to guard the king. Selen and Philo are here as well. Selen sends psychic waves of love to Sir Lloyd. Alan is nervous about the match. He expresses his fear to the girls. Just then, they notice that Su and Shoma are present for the match. Riho informs the king of Azami that there could be danger. She wants him to cancel the exhibition match. On hearing from Chrome that she is friends with Marie, the king agrees to discuss it over tea. In Kunlun, Alka contemplates Yuji's betrayal. She wonders if anyone will rescue her. Just then, the seal opens. It's Lloyd. He jumps in to rescue her. He tells her he had fallen into the same hole once, and since then, decided to be strong enough to help people. She hugs him. Yug, on the other hand, gives a situation report to Su and Shoma. She says the gate to Kunlun has been shut off, and hence there are no more irregularities. They have Makona with them. Alka and Lloyd have made it out of the hole. They are now aware of the situation at the portal gate. Alka does not appear bothered. She informs Lloyd she has a plan and tells him to hurry to the village. Lloyd, Alka, and a few villagers are gathered around the traveling artillery. They gather to send Lloyd off to Azami. She has instructed him on what to do. Mrs. Locomo sends him off using magic. Lloyd also uses his magic to propel himself even further. Back in Azami, everyone is gathered in the stadium for the exhibition match. The king gives the go-ahead for the match to commence. Alan charges toward a figure in a hoodie with a hatchet. He strikes but it is a decoy. Makona appears up in the air, wings spread out. She is Alan's opponent. Lloyd's friends are shocked at this new development. Makona surges forward in Alan's direction and strikes him, sending him flying across the wall. Due to the aggressive hit, the wall is broken. Alan is already throwing up blood. The Azami king is not having it. He asks the king of the Jew Empire what is going on. The man apologizes for not being completely honest. He says the Azami king should consider an alliance between the two kingdoms to take over the world. He adds that the Jiu Empire has the technology to turn humans into powerful, obedient weapons, using the power of monsters, while the Amazi Kingdom possesses the resources and finances to fund a global conquest. As he explains this to the Amazi King, Alan and Makona continue to fight. Alan is no match for Makona, as she keeps knocking him down. He soon becomes unconscious. When asked his thoughts, the Amazi king is speechless at first. Chrome and Choline try to dissuade him, but Shoma stops them. The Amazi king replies that when the demon lord Abaddon took over five years ago, it caused his people much pain, 
and because of that, he declines the offer. After the Amazi king rejects the offer, the king of the Jiu Empire signals Yug to come. Just before she is about to play her part, Riho and Philo stop her. They claim to have an idea about her plans. They believe she wants to take the Holy Sword and unlock the last dungeon. Selene and Marie join them, adding that Yug left Lloyd and Alka back in Kunlun because they were most likely to get in her way. They all agree to not let her get away with it. Yug is unnerved. She asks them how they intend to stop her. They insist they will not go down without a fight. Yua is furious. She releases a handful of Abaddon's locusts on the villagers in the stadium, holding them hostage. Jiu's king, on the other hand, is still trying to convince the king of Amazi to change his mind. Immediately, Chrome calls out for them to attack. The villagers are not just villagers. They had been replaced with soldiers and adventurers. They begin to attack the locusts, much to the surprise of all the opponents. Behind Shoma, Murthafan appears. He orders Shoma to leave. Shoma is stubborn. Murthafan strips and declares he will show him the wonders of agriculture. He has two weapons, the Scythe of Adamus and the Tablet of Destiny. Shoma tells Murthafan that he is doing it all for Lloyd. He claims he does not wish Lloyd to be tired of the world like he is, and so he is preparing a great stage with the best supporting actors to enable Lloyd to be his best. He teases Murthafan about being strong, but still ordinary. In a split second, he is in front of Murthafan and uses magic to send him crashing into the wall. Riho and Marie are trying their magic with the locusts. They use fire, but realize it will take too long to destroy them individually. Before they decide on what to do, Makona uses her tentacles to separate them and charges toward them, but Makona just brushes her fingers on Marie's face and begins giggling. Philo then kicks her into a wall. In the king's court, Geo's king knocks out Chrome and Choline. He orders the king of Amazi to lead him to the holy sword. Alan comes to his rescue and strikes the Geo king, cutting off one arm. However, the halves join right back together. Alan is startled. The Jew King claims he was born special and is made of runes like a hero, human, immortal, and others. He adds that he was created by Alka, when the world was still in chaos, to save and lead humanity using runes. According to him, he was supposed to vanish once it was done, but he couldn't. He became bound to the world in a half-baked way. He claims his existence began to fade, and he was seen as different things by different people. When asked why he is causing destruction, he replies that he wants to vanish. To do that, he has to kill Alka, turn someone else into the hero, and make himself the root of all evil. This will make it possible for him to die. He intends to turn Lloyd into the hero. At that moment, a fog appeared at the center of the stadium. When it clears up, it reveals Lloyd. He begins asking about Alan and the match. He spots Yug and tells her Alka had told him about her. He says Alka told him that Yug ran off because she could not resurrect Vritra and closed up the gate so that no one would go after her. Yug defends herself and says she did not do it on purpose. She tells him that she wants to fill the world with demon lords and bring it to its knees. Lloyd pretends not to believe her. Marie explains to Lloyd the cause of the locusts. Then, he orders Yug to give Ritra's egg to him because he had been ordered to destroy it. She refuses. Instead, she takes out the sweet-like equipment she always sucks on and flings it into the air. It creates a red circle. Soon, a giant golem comes out of the circle. The golem uses a light force to pick up an unconscious Makona and suck her into its core. Marie pleads with Lloyd to help. Lloyd and the golem begin a fight. Lloyd uses magic to destroy its arm. To his surprise, the arm is regenerated. UG is using a remote controller to control the golem. Lloyd is not giving up. He destroys the arms and legs again. Still, they grow right back. Next, Yug tries to create the light force again and directs it at Lloyd, but he dodges. The golem then strikes Lloyd down. Marie and the others decide to help. Marie suggests the golem is using Mykona as its regeneration core. If Mykona is freed, the ability should be lower it. While they make plans, the golem keeps attacking Lloyd, who is now extremely weak. He contemplates his inability to defeat a real monster, while Philo orders Marie and Riho to go and help him. The golem is still stomping its foot on Lloyd now. He begins to bleed. To Yug's surprise, Murthofan uses his scythe to hold up the golem's foot. While holding it up, he encourages Lloyd to get up. Riho and Marie try to call out to Makona to wake up, but she is still unconscious. They call out again, and she wakes up. Murthofan, on the other hand, climbs on the golem still fighting it. Also, Lloyd finally gets up, motivated by Murthafan's words. Trying to keep Makona conscious, Riho says she will give those panties she got at Kunlun to her if she stays awake. She lies, saying that it is Marie's panties. On hearing this, Makona revives herself and gets out of the golem, bringing it down to the ground. She grabs the panties from Riho, blushing as she face hugs it. Salen, running towards Yuge, 
grabs Vritra's egg away from her. She admonishes Vritra for staying in when there is chaos everywhere. She then begins to recite data about Lloyd, which she calls the teachings of Sir Lloyd. The egg begins to move as she recites hastily without a pause. Soon, the egg explodes. Vritra is out, still like a belt. He apologizes and pleads with her to stop. He wraps himself around Selene, much to Yug's shock. Yug is surprised Vritra can unseal himself. Again, the golem gets up, but this time, Lloyd defeats it. Yug's shock grows. She calls on Shoma and Sue to help. They are instead taking pictures of Lloyd and calling him a hero. Yug realizes they only help so that Lloyd could be a hero. As she speaks, out of the red circle come fire rocks, destroying all the remaining locusts. Alka is there. Yug is not giving up. She babbles on about creating a more advanced world. She tells Alka that she will keep trying until she gets it. Alka too promises to keep tagging along. Shoma and Sue grab Yug while she is still speaking. Sue says he will not kill her yet, because he still has some things to help Lloyd with. He congratulates Lloyd, and promises to bring more evil deeds before they disappear. In the next scene, Mirtha Fan is now an official soldier. The friends are at Lloyd's house. Lloyd is serving food. Alka and Selene are still fighting over Lloyd's attention. He settles them down, thanks them for showing up, and they eat. 